Margaret Prestard, who's from Women of Colour in the Global Women's Strike. She's from Barbados, now living in Los Angeles. She's the host and producer of a morning drive time show, radio show, called Sojourner Truth on Pacifica Radio, KPFK. She's also author of the path-breaking book on women's experiences of immigration, Black Women Bringing It All Back Home. Today I will be reporting on a struggle in Benton Harbor, Michigan. And to start by saying that during the Bush years, very hard time, during the Bush years, the struggle in our communities were pretty invisible. Now it is true that there are high moments in our movement to change the world, and then there are lower movements. Nevertheless, Anytime there is oppression and people are suffering, we have to assume that people are organizing against it and are struggling against it. And in telling the story of Benton Harbor, Michigan in the United States, gives and explains some of the reasons that that struggle and other struggles like it remained invisible during the Bush, Bush years. To just say a little bit about Benton Harbor, Michigan. It is not far from Detroit. Many of you are familiar with Motown music. You know, the Four Tops and Smokey Robinson and that bat beat that came out of Detroit. Also, a lot of organizing happened in Detroit. It is the home of the auto industry and the auto workers, workers that struggle so very hard, uh, now facing a lot of takeaways and a lot of black people <laughs> fleeing sharecropping, which is a little bit above slavery in the United States, went to places like Detroit to make a way for themselves. Benton Harbor, Michigan is not that far from Detroit. And the people in Benton Harbor are living under what we call apartheid, not we call, are apartheid-like conditions that we're familiar with because of South Africa. But the idea that within the United States today, with a black president now, people are living under apartheid-like conditions is an outrage. The city is 94% black. It has an average income of $8,000 a year. Many of us here are from the global south. So that, and within that context, is certainly a lot more money than a lot of people around the world. Within the context, however, of the United States, and given the fact that right across the river from Benton Harbor is a city called St. Joseph's that is mainly white with an average income of $41,000 a year tells you the whole story of what's happening in Benton Harbor, Michigan. The people there have confronted racism, police illegality, a corrupt criminal justice system, corrupt elected officials, cross burnings, and a lot more. And the story, uh, most recently, of Benton Harbor began when the police killed yet another black man, happens quite frequently in the United States, the city broke out in a riot, what we call a rebellion, that lasted for three days. Cross burnings. Cross burnings were used in the Deep South, in, in Mississippi and in other places, to really terrorize black people, burned by a group called the Ku Klux Klan, wearing white sheets, really representing Jim Crow racism within the United States. Many people believe 
that they are over in the United States. I'm here to tell you that they are not. A cross burning happened last year in Benton Harbor outside the home of an elderly woman who dared to say outside of a courtroom, we black people have to stick together. That's all she said. And as a result of that, a cross was burned outside her home. There are other examples, but there's no time to discuss them uh, today. The women of Benton Harbor agitated and mobilized, started picketing about the injustices against their children, the police harassment of their children, the fact that the majority of those going through the jails and prisons of that county were their children. And Mrs. Edward Pinckney became active with that group of women. She was married to a reverend, a Baptist minister, the Reverend Edward Pinckney. And she brought him along, encouraged him to join the movement. And Reverend Pinckney became one of the spokes, grassroots spokespeople for that movement. Now, that's not unusual. Those of us living in other countries and here in the United States know very well that when it comes to struggling for justice, that it is often the mothers, the aunts, the grandmothers that do that justice work, just as the family of the, um, the Cuban Five and others that are struggling for justice. But women are rarely recognized. That justice work is rarely recognized, and indeed, in the women's, and not seen as part of the women's movement, but indeed, it is part of the women's movement. And it is often racism that hides the fact that this is part of the women's movement, and the women's movement is instead promoted as those feminists that are just interested in self-promotion but have very little interest in justice. Mrs. Dorothy Pinckney is part of that women's movement. I should also say that Benton Harbor, Michigan is also the international headquarters of the multinational corporation Whirlpool. Many people here have heard of Whirlpool. They make washing machines and, and other things. And Whirlpool controls a lot of the power, political power, and the resources within Benton Harbor. And when Whirlpool, in conjunction with land developers decided they wanted to take over 400 acres of Benton Harbor property. Benton Harbor happens to sit on lakefront, on Lake Michigan, as well as riverfront property to build the Jack Nicholas exclusive golf course and to build very expensive homes the Black Autonomy Network, Reverend Pinckney and Dorothy Pinckney, protested loudly along with the grassroots in Benton Harbor. And they did something that Whirlpool and the power structure in Benton Harbor thought was totally unacceptable. They organized a recall of, uh, of a city, an elected city official, who was in the pockets of Whirlpool and the developers and whose vote they needed to go through with this project. And they mobilized that recall and the grassroots won that recall election, defeating the most powerful people in the county where Benjamin Harbor 
is located.